Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'm certainly very happy to, uh, to be able to share some of my research with respect to uh, One Health related things that we're doing in the lab with you all today. So today we'll be talking about some of the research that we've been doing with respect to salmonella uh, as it relates to, to the uh, One Health uh, approach and how we can use this approach to improve food safety. So, you know, I think we all know that salmonella is a major global cause of foodborne disease. Um, it, it causes 93 million cases of gastroenteritis each year of which approximately 80 million is, uh, is foodborne. And we can see the number of cases, hospitalizations and deaths in Canada and, and the US. So certainly a major uh, human pathogen and a major cause of foodborne illness. It's a very diverse uh, genus. There's two species, Enterica and Bongori, with Enterica being the, the major cause of uh, foodborne illness. And uh, Salmonella Enterica is further divided into six subspecies. Uh, subspecies one, which has over 1500 serotypes, is, is the major concern for foodborne illness. So we've been working on, on salmonella for a while now, and we've developed what we call the Salmonella Food Systemics Database. And this is a database that's online. It contains 3,143 isolates, and we, we have uh, sequenced all of them. So we have draft genomes for all of the isolates. We also have metadata, and, uh, and, and we also importantly have the isolates, which means that we can do research on them. You can see the link to the, to the database there. And the idea is that by conducting research on, on isolates within this database in a cohesive way, we can really begin to address food safety from a One Health perspective by developing interventions that would reduce contamination in animals, uh, understand transmission dynamics of salmonella in the environment, and then uh, begin to really uh, understand the most important isolates from a, from a pathogenesis point of view uh, with respect to their ability to cause disease in humans. So uh, the, the database currently has uh, 232 uh, serotypes represented among the 3,143 isolates. And you can see the, uh, the serotypes there, the distribution. We've worked hard to, uh, to try to not only have a diversity of serotypes, but a diversity of, uh, of isolates in terms of where they were collected geographically. Uh, so we do have isolates from North America. Most of them are, do come from North America, but we also have isolates from Asia, from Africa, um, and from Europe. And also a diversity of, uh, of sources from which the isolates were were isolated from. So food sources, the environment, animals, and, and so forth. So what we, what, we, what we did was we sequenced um, all of the genomes. Um, you know, there's 3,143 isolates in, in Southwest, uh, but we actually added a, several additional um, genomes that were sequenced uh, because they came from a specific collection called the 100K genome collection from UC Davis. And, and so uh, we wanted to compare um, our collection to some of those isolates. So we sequenced them um, using, uh, using the MySeq Lumina platform. And uh, we used a, a program called Saturn V to understand uh, and, and characterize it, the, the genome, the pan genome. So Saturn V is a program that will identify core genes which are genes found in, in all of the isolates, flexible genes, which are genes found in some of the isolates, more than one isolate, and unique genes, which are found in a single isolate. And so from our analysis of, of the 3,376 genomes, we calculated the core genome to be uh, a size of 955 genes. Uh, we also identified over 35,000 flexible genes and over 26,500 unique genes. And so 
this uh, allowed us then to create a phylogenetic tree uh, based on, um, on SNPs. And um, um, the, uh, the phylogenetic tree as, is what you see here. It's uh, uh, here we see an unrooted maximum likelihood tree based on the 3,376 uh, genomes. And I just wanna point out here the incredible diversity. So we see several clades, um, certainly within um, subspecies one, two major clades and uh, of isolates. Um, and then we see the other uh, subspecies uh, further out. And we can see that, um, you know, I, I just wanna show that and really highlight the diversity, the incredible diversity within Salmonella enterica. Uh, the inset image is the same as the larger image, except that um, in the larger image, you see that there's breaks in the arms. So it really shows you just how diverse this, uh, this species is. You can also see the, um, the sources from which we obtain the isolates uh, at the bottom there. So we've really tried to create a, a, a very diverse collection for this work. So, one of the things that we really wanted to do was, was try to um, understand the salmonella infection cycle and, and, and really make sense of what's been reported in the literature. Uh, there's quite a diversity of, of um, literature with respect to virulence genes uh, in salmonella that, that's required for human infection. And, and, and in some cases, some contradictions where groups present for example, certain genes that are essential uh, for infection and other groups will characterize isolates that don't have those genes but are still uh, capable of causing human illness. So we really wanted to try to uh, develop a way to, to address that. And so what we came up with was to use multiple models of infection uh, to try to model the entire salmonella infection cycle. So beginning with ingestion, where we, we have a human gastrointestinal model, uh, which is, it's called the TIM. And you can actually feed the model uh, like a food, a slurry that's contaminated with salmonella. Um, and it, it, this, the TIM model mimics the entire gastrointestinal tract from the mouth to the anus. And so um, we can obtain an understanding of how the salmonella, for example, would survive in the stomach and in the the large gas, the large uh, um, gastrointestinal tract, for example. And uh, number two, digestion. So again, this is uh, uh, primarily the stomach. Um, so uh, you know, um, trying to gain an understanding of, of the ability of salmonella and various different isolates to survive at low acid pH and and when they're stressed. We also have an ileal microbiota model that uh, that we use for that. Step three in the infection cycle is adhesion to intestinal epithelial cells. And so we use a gentamicin protection high throughput cell assay um, to, to look at the ability of different isolates to, uh, to both um, attach and then invade and, and also survive within epithelial cells. And, and the same for uh, step four in the infection cycle. Um, and then in step five, we also use the gentamicin protection high, cell, high throughput cell virulence assay, uh, but this time we looked at the ability of the uh, um, isolates to survive in macrophages as well as epithelial cells. And we included an amoeba model of survival and Ancanth amoeba model of survival. And then finally six, uh, clinical disease, uh, we use a murine model of infection. So what I wanna do is, is share some highlights of, of uh, some of these models um, and, and some results. And then we'll take a look at how we're applying this data within a One Health context. So in order to, to uh, predict variants, we, we really focused on, on four of the models that I've uh, uh, discussed in the previous slide. The human gastrointestinal tract model, uh, the, uh, the disadvantage of that model is it's, it's not very high throughput. So we can only do a few um, isolates, and, and so it wasn't really useful um, because we really want to look at a large number of isolates in these studies. 
So we focused on, on four models for our prediction of virulence, the murine model, um, the, uh, the gentamicin uh, protection assay model uh, for invasion and survival in epithelial cells and macrophages, and the ANCANTH amoeba model. We characterize the virulence um, of each isolate in the, independently into high or low, um, and in some cases, intermediate. And because we'd sequenced the genomes for each of those isolates, we then characterized the, uh, the genomes, analyzed the genomes. We first split the genomes into KMERS, 31, 31 MERS in length, and we mapped the KMERS to, uh, to genes uh, within the PAN genome. The idea being to identify phylogeny-based clusters that were consistent with virulence. Um, so that is uh, genes that were present in isolates characterized as high, but weren't present in, in isolates characterized as low. Um, and, and, and the idea is that those markers could then be used to develop assays that would predict virulence uh, from the genome. And also uh, those markers could be used uh, to develop approaches to control the presence of these bacteria in livestock, for example, and the environment. So we, we initially started uh, our work with 43 isolates. Uh, 33 were food associated isolates. Uh, and you can see them here in the tree. And then we included 10 clinical salmonella enteritidis isolates. So these were isolates that have come from foodborne infections and were isolated from, from the feces of infected individuals. One of our uh, hypotheses here is that, uh, while if you look in the literature, um, certainly old textbooks, um, you'll see statements like all salmonella enterica are, are potentially pathogenic to humans. Um, in reality, when we look at epidemiological data, we see that that's not the case. We see really only a few um, serotypes that are consistently causing human illness, uh, maybe as few as 100 um, serotypes out of the more than 2,600. And so uh, we hypothesize that uh, the, the, the isolates that don't typically cause illness uh, perhaps are lacking in, in, in the genes that would be required to cause illness in humans. And so in this work, we used enteritidis as a collection of isolates that typically do cause illness in humans. And we compared the enteritis to uh, isolates that are, uh, that are outside of the top 70 uh, serotypes that cause illness in Canada. We also used uh, control strains, two control strains, a positive control and a negative control. Um, the well-known SL1344 um, strain of Salmonella typhimerium and a, a Delta uh, knockout mutant uh, deficient in NVA and SSEB. We use these strains to normalize our results. So you can see, for example, the wild type um, is very good at uh, attaching to invading and surviving in, uh, in this case, um, human epithelial cells, whereas the, uh, the knockout can attach, but uh, is, is much less effective at invading and surviving. So the, uh, the first model that uh, I want to share with you is our, our gentamicin protection uh, high throughput cell assay. So this is done in 96 well plates um, with intestinal epithelial cells. You can see the cell line there or, or human macrophages. So we looked at adherence or attachment, invasion and survival. To look at uh, adherence, Cells, the uh, epithelial cells were incubated with individual salmonella isolates for 90 minutes. Um, and then uh, the, the sample was, uh, was centrifuged and, and what remained in the supernate was, uh, was plated. For invasion, the uh, samples were incubated for 180 minutes, followed by uh, uh, um, followed by the uh, gentamicin, we added gentamicin to the wells 
to kill any uh, exogenous bacteria. The, uh, the cells were then centrifuged and the, the pellet lysed to re release the salmonella, which were then plated. And for survival, the same approach was taken, except that uh, the incubation was for 18 hours instead of, instead of three hours. And we simply used a, a cutoff of CFUs um, per milliliter um, or, or, or gram um, in terms of determining the level of pathogenicity. So you can see on the bottom left side of the screen there, where um, if there was greater than log five, um, then that was determined to be high, uh, uh, isolate that would be highly virulent. If it was below log four, the isolate was considered to be low in virulence. And if um, it was between log four and five, then it was intermediate in virulence. So here we see uh, some results. So uh, at the top, uh, the graph at the top is invasion, and then the graph at the bottom is survival. The positive control and negative control, um, the Salmonella typhimerium strain uh, are at the left-hand side of the graph. So the positive control is at the top, you can see, uh, and, and this uh, would be considered highly virulent. The, uh, the, the now delta knockout is, uh, is, is beside that and, and so would be considered low virulence. And so we compared the um, isolates from the Southwest collection to those. So you can see that we have some that are high in virulence, um, some that are low um, and, 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 and some that are intermediate. And so if we map this to our phylogenetic tree, uh, we see some interesting things. For example, we see that uh, Salmonella enteritidis, uh, the clinical isolates are capable of uh, attaching, invading, surviving quite well in uh, human epithelial cells, which is what we would expect since they cause human illness. Uh, other isolates from uh, um, serotypes known to cause human illness like typhimerium um, and, um, and uh, Newport also we're quite good at um, invading, attaching, invading, and surviving. So um, our next model was uh, a murine model of infection. So this is uh, a this this model produces a systemic infection, um, and so uh, in in this model, the uh, the the Salmonella isolates are infected. Um, or the, sorry, the mice are infected with the individual salmonella um, isolates. Uh, and it's a, I, I haven't put it here, but this is a streptomycin model. So the mice are first treated with streptomycin to, to reduce the background flora. Three days post-infection, the mice, mice are then euthanized uh, and we, uh, you know, collect various data, including weight um, and, and organs such as the spleen and liver and, and, and we do plate count on those organs. Uh, here is just some of the parameters that we've collected uh, in, in the model. Um, so I've already talked about body weight, uh, but also splenic index, uh, spleen and liver CFUs. And we also look at various um, in, inflammatory cytokines. And here again, we see the, uh, the, the um, positive and negative controls um, and, and so um, these were the cutoffs that were used with respect to uh, determining virulence um, when we were analyzing the, uh, the body weight, uh, the splenic index and cytokines. For the CFUs, um, we, we still um, had this value of uh, 10 to the five being high virulence and 10 to the four being low virulence. So here we, um, we see um, some of the results from the spleen and the liver. Um, again, on the left-hand side of the graphs uh, are the positive and negative controls, and then the various isolates from Salfos are, are presented. So as with the uh, high cell throughput assay, we see some isolates that are high in virulence. Um, more in this case, they're low in virulence as compared to the, the, cell, uh, the cell assay. High, high throughput cell assay and, and some isolates that are intermediate. 
So again, if we map this to our tree, um, we see that the, the isolates that would be viewed as, as being typically capable of causing illness in humans, that is enteritis, isolates from serotype enteritis, type from Merriam, um, are, are, are uh, highly virulent. However, um, in comparison to the uh, high cell throughput assay, Newport, for example, shows intermediate virulence. Um, and we also see um, some isolates, like for example, um, an isolate uh, serotype Canada isolate uh, that is also capable of, of uh, causing illness in, in, in the uh, murine model. So the point here is that while we see some similarities between these two models, we are seeing uh, some differences. So finally, uh, the third model is this uh, ancanth amoeba model. So ancanth amoeba is a, a genus of, uh, of amoeba that's commonly found in the environment. It has two forms, uh, a trophozoite form, which is a metabolically active form, and a cyst form, which is a, a dormant form. So in our assay, we use a trophozoite form, uh, which we inoculated with uh, individual isolates of, uh, of salmonella. Um, and then following bacterial uptake, add, we added gentamicin to kill exogenous bacteria. And we simply looked for growth um, of, uh, of the bacteria using uh, um, absorbance. And so here we see the results. So um, on the top is, is just the, the, the net CFU counts. Um, you can see where the uh, positive control uh, SL1344 strain is, uh, is there in the gray bar and the, the, the knockout is in the gold. Um, and then at the bottom, um, in the bottom graph, what we did was we, we produced ratios of, of CFUs um, in relation to the positive control. So you can see that we have some uh, some uh, isolates from Southwest that uh, were able to grow uh, much better than the positive control, uh, but most of them um, were, were um, their growth was, was less than the positive control. And, and there were a, a few that were less than the negative control. So, um, you know, we, we've completed all these models. Uh, we see some similarities uh, with respect to isolates and their behavior among across the models, but we see many differences. So, so we use what's called the Bonferroni method to compare the, uh, the models um, in order to be able to ask the question, do we really see similarities among all, um, some of the isolates, for example, with respect to their ability to cause virulence within these models? So for example, do some of the isolates consistently have a high virulence phenotype in all of the models? Do some of the isolates consistently have a low virulence phenotype? So when we did this analysis, we, we found that we, we did see some um, isolates that were consistently high in virulence among the, uh, the different models. And so you can th these are the isolates that are in red um, among these models. So this uh, provides us then with a, a pool of isolates from which we could um, begin to derive um, information with respect to new virulence uh, factors that perhaps have not been identified yet. And also um, we could look at the, the virulence factors in these isolates and use them to develop markers for diagnostic assays. So this brings us to the applications of this work. So we focus on three applications. Uh, prediction of virulence in salmonella isolates, um, which is useful uh, with respect to human illness. Um, development of, uh, or, or identification of targets for development of universal vaccine for livestock, animals, and, um, and improved diagnostics for use in foods, um, particularly with an emphasis on, on food crops that are grown in the environment. So we'll talk about each of these in, in turn. So um, as, as I said previously, all salmonella um, are not created equally. This is uh, data from various countries showing the top 10 um, serotypes that are 
responsible for illness in, in, in each country or parts of country, in the case of Mexico. And so there's several things here that are interesting. Um, first of all, we see that um, we, we see common stereotypes among countries um, with respect to uh, the causes of uh, salmonellosis. Uh, they may differ in the percentage of, of illnesses caused, um, but they're present in each country. But we also see uh, stereotypes that are uh, different. So um, here, the ones in the block represent stereotypes that are not present um, in all of the, uh, the data from the countries. So we see some similarities and some differences. What I wanna highlight is that, and this is really a consistent theme that emerges among countries where sur surveillance occurs, is that as typically 10, 10 stereotypes tend to cause the majority of illness in each country. So in Canada, these 10 stereotypes cause 75% uh, of the illness. If you look at the other countries, um, they, 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 they still cause uh, the majority of illness. So this really, again, highlights this question of virulence. Um, why is it that, you know, there's only a few serotypes um, that seem to be consistently implicated in human illness when there's more than 2,600 um, serotypes of salmonella enterica? So we want to develop the ability to predict the, the virulence phenotype from genotype um, as a way to begin answering this question. So we um, started with isolates that were identified from the, uh, the, the uh, models um, to have high and low virulence phenotypes. And in this particular work, we focused on the isolates that uh, agreed uh, between the, the uh, high, cell, high throughput cell virulence assay and the uh, murine model. So we have 12 isolates. You can see the serotypes there um, that were identified as high in virulence in both models and seven um, isolates from serotypes that were identified as low virulence in both models. And so we, um, we use Saturn V uh, again to analyze the genomes of these isolates. We also added a, 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 an additional 33 isolates from Sophos that were unknown in levels of virulence. That is, we had not, um, wh while we, we ran them through the models, we we, these were blinded isolates for this assay or for this analysis. So um, based on these isolates, we, we identified the core genes, the flexible genes and the unique genes using Saturn V as before. But this time we focused on the flexible genes. Those are genes found in more than one isolate um, for our, our analysis of virulence markers. And uh, in order to, to uh, analyze a gene and had to have greater than 90% of homology over greater than 80% of coverage of, of the gene. So we conducted a principal component analysis uh, for the presence and absence of, flexible, of the flexible genes in, in these isolates. Um, and, and, and so here we see the results. So um, you can, the red, the, the red grouping at the top would be isolates that were predicted to be in uh, high in virulence with the red, the isolates with the red uh, dots being the, the 12 isolates um, that we know to be high in virulence. Uh, isolates with blue dots are the seven isolates that we know to be low in virulence and the ones in green are the un previously unknown ones. Um, and so uh, the results show that this approach was, was a good predictor of virulence, uh, but it wasn't perfect. For example, we have two isolates, S240 and S357, that should be low in virulence that were predicted to be high in virulence. So um, we, we want to refine this approach. So, you know, our, our data to this point showed that specific markers could predict the general pattern, uh, but there's some exceptions that it would miss out on. So to address that, we use logical equations to force the inclusion of the exceptions um, while we still retained the ability to, uh, to predict the, the virulence um, as we did in our principal component analysis. So when we add the logical equations, we're able to, to better predict both high and low virulence. 
And, and so this is just a, what you see here is an analysis of high valence markers in, in 40 salmonella genomes on the left side. And on the right side, it's, it's an analysis of low valence markers in the same genomes. And so um, what I want to point out is that in isolates that are considered to be low virulence, um, which are the green isolates, the isolates in, uh, the, represented by the green bars, we see that the, the number of uh, virulence, high virulence markers are lower than in the isolates that are predicted to be high in virulence. And when we look at low virulence markers, we see the situation is reversed. That is, isolates that are predicted to be high in virulence have a lower number of low virulence markers than isolates that are predicted to be low in virulence. So this told us that uh, this approach was working. So then we um, analyzed an additional 2,544 isolates um, using this approach and, 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 and we grouped them. So what you're seeing here is, is the results of that. So on the x-axis are the number of high virulence markers. Uh, we use 15. Um, in, in this analysis. On the y-axis is the number of low virulence markers, uh, 23 of them. And so each isolate was um, scanned for the number of each high or low virulence uh, markers in the genome, and they were grouped this way. So the high virulence, um, the isolates that are predicted to be highly virulent are in the bottom right quadrant of, the, of this, uh, this graph. The ones that are predicted to be low in virulence are in the upper left quadrant. And then you have these intermediate uh, groups here. So based on our analysis, the majority of the isolates, uh, over 1,500, were predicted to be high in virulence. Uh, and about 450 were predicted to be low in virulence. And then, as I've said, there's these intermediate ones uh, and various groups that we've delineated. So. <clears throat> Um, so, so before we get to universal vaccines, so that work is ongoing. Uh, we continue to uh, to use the these approaches to predict virulence in in different Salmonella uh, populations and collections, um, in, in collaboration with with some of our uh, collaborators in the U.S. and and, and Ireland. Um, and the idea is that if we can perhaps predict isolates that will be more virulent um, or less virulent, then uh, this can help us with respect to um, risk uh, uh, analysis um, approaches in terms of food safety. So moving on to um, the uh, universal vaccine. Um, so the idea here is to develop an approach to control foodborne pathogens in livestock because many foodborne pathogens are zoonotic. If we can control the, uh, the pathogens in livestock, then we can control their spread to the environment, um, including food and water, and therefore um, decrease contamination uh, of, uh, of food and, and foodborne outbreaks, human foodborne outbreaks. So we want to take the data that we obtained and identify virulence markers in salmonella that, that uh, are conserved in other foodborne pathogens. So um, <clears throat> this is uh, some data from a recent paper we published. Um, and what this shows are, are some of the markers that we've identified. A number of them are hypothetical, uh, but we do have uh, um, some um, markers that are, are well known. Um, and so what you see here is um, what you're seeing here in this figure are the the uh, the on the at the top are the descriptions of the uh, the markers. Um, at the bottom, uh, it, it, we see where they are in the uh, in the genome, um, and in this case, we've mapped them to the uh, to the positive control strain, the SL1344, the Salmonella typhimerium strain. Over on the right. Um, we see the prediction of phenotype. Uh, so where it says prediction, that's using the, uh, the genomic prediction approach. Um, and then we see the phenotype as determined 
from uh, the spleen results from the marine model and the epithelial uh, results, the epithelial cell results from the uh, high throughput cell assay. And so, uh, and then also on the uh, right, where you see the red arrows, those are um, isolates that are predicted to be high in virulence, and, uh, and the green arrows are isolates predicted to be low in virulence. So um, generally what we see is that the majority of markers are, are present in, in the isolates that uh, are predicted to be high in virulence, uh, while with the isolates that are predicted to be low in virulence, for example, at, at the bottom of the, uh, of the screen there, you see that uh, the, there are much less markers. So um, <clears throat> what we did was we looked at genomes of other enteric pathogens, uh, foodborne pathogens, um, Campylobacter jejuni, enterohemorrhagic E. coli, vibrio cholera, and Listeria monocytogenes. And we wanted to see if any of the virulence markers were conserved. And, we, and, and, and so we identified um, a number of isolates that were conserved. So uh, what we're seeing here is um, the average protein identity between um, proteins uh, observed within the five enteropathogens um, of those described in the figure that we, we just saw. And so the, uh, on the right uh, top there, you can see a color key and, um, and that's for protein identity. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, generally speaking, we found that the uh, proteins here um, do correlate with, uh, with those implicated in salmonella virulence. And, uh, and, and so these proteins would then represent potential uh, candidates for a universal vaccine um, ag against all of these uh, pathogens in livestock. And here we see the, uh, the frequency. So whereas in the previous slide, we were talking about identity, protein identity. Here we see the frequency of the markers um, in, in the five enteropathogens. Um, anywhere from, from zero to, uh, to 100 percent. So um, just to highlight the fact that the, uh, the you know, in, in uh, Campylobacter jejuni there, we see that the frequency for the virulence markers is, is, is low. Uh, it's not necessarily zero for all of the markers. That, that red bar represents anywhere from zero to, um, to 10 percent uh, frequency. So again, um, Certainly for the majority of the enteropathogens, we have uh, um, you know, markers that could be used, um, or at least uh, um, peptides of those markers could be used in a universal vaccine. So then finally, uh, we'll finish off with um, our approach for improved diagnostics that could be used uh, to monitor for um, salmonella as a way to uh, understand better the transmission dynamics in the environment. So uh, current rapid salmonella assays suffer from poor diagnostic specificity. Um, for example, there's a high level of cross-reactivity with bacteria uh, within the enterobacteriaceae, such as Citrobacter, as well as E. coli. So we want to develop a, a new sequence-based uh, rapid confirmatory salmonella assay, again, taking advantage of the markers that we identified. So the, the assay would, com, would, would combine specific markers for salmonella, as well as virulence markers, um, as antibiotic resistance genes, um, and serotype markers. So instead of the traditional way of confirming salmonella, which includes um, enrichment and selective plating, uh, followed by biochemicals, um, traditional cough and white serotyping, and so forth, and antibiotic MIC um, assays and so forth, we want to combine all of that in a, into a single sequence based assay. So <clears throat> the idea is that this would then be used to improve on our microbial risk analysis framework. So traditional microbial risk analysis combines three aspects, risk assessment, risk management, and risk communication, where the risk assessment aspect is science-based and that's used to inform risk management, which is uh, policy developed from, from the science. And I just wanna emphasize that, you know, in traditional risk and uh, microbial risk analysis, um, the management of food safety risk is, is based on, on what I 
view as a simplified uh, approach. That is that um, it's generally assumed that there's a homo 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 homogeneous distribution of virulence markers across a given species. So that is that different um, isolates within that species, um, in this case salmonella, are often viewed as the same with respect to their ability to cause human illness, even though we know that that's not the case. Um, and, and of course, then the risk communication um, translates that data and communicates it to, to the uh, respective stakeholders. So in our um, approach, the idea is that the risk analysis framework would be refined. So um, by analyzing the genotype and phenotype of the salmonella isolates and, and delineating them into high and, and low and medium virulence, then this would present a new paradigm where instead of managing food safety risk at the species level, we could actually manage that risk at the isolate level. So that is the actual isolates that we would find in food, uh, we could actually obtain specific information about that isolate and, and, and then um, we could determine the risk of that individual isolate or perhaps um, a, a group of isolates that are found consistently in food as opposed to, to assuming that they're all the same with respect to their ability to cause virulence. So um, we've designed what we call SAMLSeq. And, and the SAMLSeq assay is really based on the uh, AmpliSeq approach uh, that has been developed um, by Thermo Fisher and is actually used in, um, in human health diagnostics, clinical diagnostics, for example, cancer diagnostics, um, where there are thousands of, of potential uh, cancer markers. So we've just simply adapted that to detection uh, and characterization of, of, of salmonella. So um, we start from um, a, a colony. Uh, you can see the plate there, micro colonies. Um, one, one of the things we're trying to do here is, is to speed up the, uh, the time to confirmation of salmonella uh, because currently it takes seven, eight, maybe nine days. Um, and certainly from, um, for food producers, this is problematic. Uh, for example, fresh produce growers that have uh, produced commodities that have a short shelf life, maybe two to three weeks, this is problematic uh, because if a rapid test result indicates that salmonella is present and it takes another eight or nine days to confirm that, uh, that product cannot be shipped because the shelf life uh, is, is vastly reduced at that point, maybe only five, five to 10 days left. So, so, um, so that product often has to be destroyed. But in many cases, the test results come back as not uh, being indicative of the presence of salmonella. So uh, this also would help um, reduce food waste. So we start from our, our, our micro colonies. Um, we isolate the, uh, the, the DNA. Um, and then uh, the DNA is amplified through a multiplex PCR using AmpliSeq primers that were designed for the markers that I've described um, in the previous slides. Uh, the, the, prim the primer sequences are then partially digested, libraries are produced, and, um, and then they're sequenced. So this approach takes um, uh, anywhere from two to three days, um, depending on the length of time it takes to obtain the microcolonies. So I uh, just want to show some, some early data um, from our analysis. So these are just four salmonella isolates we randomly selected from salvos um, and we ran the assay on. And so you can see the relative abundance of the markers. And really, um, I just want to highlight the, the fact that the, the coverage of the markers is relatively uniform across the, um, the isolates. I also do want to highlight that um, in some cases, there's markers that are not present in, 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 in some of the strains. So really the idea is not to look at an individual marker, but to look at the markers collectively. Um, and then with respect to, to diagnostics uh, specificity, 
Um, here we see salmonella, uh, salmonella isolate. Um, and then, you know, we include some um, non salmonella isolates. Uh, these are two isolates, uh, one E. coli, one citrobacter, known to cause false positive results um, in other in, a, in commercial assays. So we've included them. And you can see that um, the, while there are some markers identified here, they're not, uh, the, the abundance of the markers is far less than what we see um, with salmonella. So um, with that, uh, I'll stop. I'd just like to uh, thank uh, the funding sources for this work, um, Genome Canada, Ontario Genomics, Genome Quebec, as well as NSERC. Um, and, uh, and then this is the large group of people uh, that have contributed um, to this project. This was a, a large, uh, large scale applied research project. So we had uh, a group of Pan-Canadian researchers. And, uh, and so the work continues. And uh, I thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Goodrich. There was lots of, um, lots of rich information in there. It looks like we have a hand up from Michael, if you want to um, unmute yourself. Hi, Larry. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, great. Thanks. Uh, great talk. Uh, very interesting. Um, I guess the one question I had was sort of the towards the end of your, your talk about developing a, you know, sort of a multiplex PCR to detect virulence genes. I'm just wondering, you know, are you, are you thinking as well about just nanopore sequencing, long read sequencing, um, you know, some of those micro colonies, um, because you could probably get the same kind of information. And, you know, we're looking at this uh, like directly from blood bottles. So positive blood bottles, we're taking a direct sample from there. And usually bloodstream infections are, um, you know, a, a single organism infection. And we can, we can get sequences right from a blood bottle. And the way, you know, the, the nanopore works, you're getting the sequencing data coming off in real time. So within, you know, an hour or, or so, you, you could probably have a fairly good idea of a lot of those virulence markers in that particular, you know, colony. So I'm just wondering, are you thinking along those lines as well? Yeah, we are thinking along those lines. Um, in, 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 in taking this approach, we focused on and going from a colony for several reasons. Uh, and the major reason is a regulatory one. So the idea that, you know, um, if this test was to be used, for example, by the, uh, the, the CFIA, um, the, as, re as required in the compendium of, of, uh, of methods, we have to go from a from a colony. The other reason is that um, while um, certainly nanopore sequencing from, from a, a culture or like a blood culture, as you've said, or an enrichment culture can identify the markers, um, they aren't necessarily linking those markers to an individual uh, uh, bacterial cell within that enrichment. Um, there, there could be multiple cells in there. So, so that's, um, you know, uh, two of the reasons. The other thing is that which this, you know, um, I think nanopore sequencing certainly is becoming easier to do. Um, there's tools to to interpret the data, um, but for a number of um, of stakeholders like food companies, for example, who may not have, um, you know, the expertise to 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 uh, analyze that that data. The idea is that this the sample seek approach would, would be simpler. So for, so those are the reasons why we focused on on this. But certainly as a rapid test, <clears throat> uh, you know I certainly think uh, Oxford Nanopore as a rapid test um, is is the way to go um, because not only can you identify you know Salmonella, but you can identify multiple pathogens in the same sample at one time. So so certainly moving forward, that's something that uh, that we would be very interested in. Okay, thanks. There's one in the chat that says, how many genes can you target at once with the SAMOSeq assay? So the, the, the AmpliSeq technology that's based on <clears throat> is designed to target thousands of genes at one time. And, uh, as I said, it was really designed for human clinical diagnostics like cancer screening. Um, that We think that that is not practical um, for 
for food samples. So we've, uh, we've refined our markers. I think um, we're targeting 80 to 100 now, um, where, where that includes virulence markers, uh, serotype markers, um, to be able to call the serotype of each cell, um, as well as a few antibiotic resistance genes and salmonella specific markers like in the a traditional um, markers that would uh, identify salmonella. We have a comment from Giselle just saying great overview of the whole project. Yes, I'm also impressed at being able to being able to condense it into that time period. It sounds very large scale. Well, if that's it for questions, I'll just wrap up by saying a big, big thank you to Dr. Goodrich for joining us today, for taking the time um, and for the, the wonderful presentation that so um, that really demonstrates One Health so well uh, and the, the impacts of, of this work on environmental, animal, and human health. But thank you all for being here. Thank you again, Dr. Goodrich, and I hope everyone has a lovely weekend. Thank you.